This panel is going to look at applying policy and operational frameworks in a migration context. You know, one of the things we heard very much in the first two se sessions was the relationship between policies and application, how to apply existing frameworks, and with some exceptions, the need to use the modalities, the frameworks, the tools that we already have to reduce vulnerabilities for, for migrants. In our panel this afternoon, we have several speakers who will speak to different aspects of this. We will begin with Maria Fernandez Rodriguez, who is the Deputy Secretary of Access to Justice of the Ministry of Justice of Argentina and President of the Federal Council for Combating Trafficking and Exploitation of Persons and for Protection and Assistance to Victims. Dr. Fernandez is also involved in the program for inclusion of the gender perspective and fight against trafficking in persons of the Supreme Court of Justice of the Nation through the Office of Women. Bueno, buenos días a todos y a todas. En lo personal voy a referirme a la íntima relación que guarda la migración, el tráfico y la trata de personas. Para ello primero voy a presentar por un lado las diferencias que existen entre estas tres categorías, así como los puntos de base que unen a estos sujetos que las componen. En cuanto al primer punto, las diferencias. La migración es definida como el movimiento de población hacia el territorio de otro estado o dentro del mismo, que abarca todo movimiento, sea cual fuere su tamaño, su composición o sus, com o sus causas. El tráfico de personas se refiere al traslado irregular o ilícito de migrantes para ingresar a un país del cual no se es nacional y por lo tanto es una infracción al orden migratorio y hablamos entonces de un delito contra el Estado. La trata de personas es un delito ofensivo que afecta la dignidad, la libertad y la autonomía de una persona, cuyo objetivo es la cosificación y la explotación del sujeto. Hablamos entonces de un delito contra las personas, en el sentido de cuál es el interés jurídico tutelado por la norma. Sin embargo, pese a sus diferencias, las personas migrantes, las personas que son traficadas o las personas que son tratadas están atravesadas por situaciones que en mayor o en menor medida presuponen, entre otras cuestiones, la movilidad interna y externa, la ausencia o escasa presencia de familia continente, instituciones, barreras comunicacionales y culturales, desconocimiento del territorio y de los recursos de protección que podrían disponer, alta probabilidad de ser sujetos de discriminación y víctimas de delito, pobreza en todas sus dimensiones, no solo en la económica, y el sueño de poder vivir una vida mejor. Las redes que se dedican al tráfico y a la trata de personas conocen muy bien este último factor y por esta razón el mecanismo de captación mayoritario y predominante utilizado por los tratantes sigue siendo la oferta laboral engañosa las redes no necesitan ningún nivel de inversión inicial para cometer este delito a diferencia de otros delitos de criminalidad organizada como puede ser el narcotráfico aquí las víctimas hasta se endeudan para ser traficadas o bien para llegar al lugar donde luego serán explotadas. Debemos tener presente que muchas veces incluso el mecanismo de tráfico es utilizado como mecanismo de engaño y como mecanismo de captación. Empiezan con una modalidad de tráfico y terminan siendo luego explotadas en situaciones de trata. Si nosotros comparamos los factores de riesgo que tienen las, eh, la trata de personas con el tráfico, con la migración, vamos a ver una enorme superposición. Esas poblaciones en línea general tienen bajo índice de desarrollo humano, feminización de la, proces de la pobreza, limitación al acceso a servicios sociales básicos como educación, salud y una alta tasa de desempleo. 
cosificación del cuerpo y sexualidad de las mujeres y personas menores de edad, aumento de conflictos armados y violentos y desplazamientos hacia grande, de grandes masas de población sin control. Cada vez tenemos más sofisticadas redes de tratantes y traficantes intermediarios. Tenemos políticas migratorias inadecuadas, faltas de controles apropiados, fronteras porosas, hogares desintegrados y disfuncionales muchas veces, y acá estoy refiriéndome a cuáles son los factores de riesgo de la trata de personas. Poco control y seguimiento de adopciones de personas menores de edad, entornos de violencia intrafamiliar y de violencia sexual, consumo problemático, la proliferación que existe actualmente de la explotación sexual comercial, pornografía, incluyendo la pornografía de menores cada vez en más aumento. En, particularmente este, en Argentina, las víctimas de nacionalidad extranjera reciben la misma existen, eh, asistencia que está planificada para las víctimas nacionales. No hacemos ningún tipo de diferencia. Tienen derecho a permanecer en el país y si es su deseo pueden retornar voluntariamente y en este caso generalmente contamos con la asistencia de la Organización Internacional de las Migraciones. Las víctimas extranjeras presentan una característica particular. Se presentan muy temerosas de que le pueda eh, sucederles por el hecho de no estar regularizadas en su situación migratoria. En el mismo proceso de vulneración de sus derechos por parte de las tratantes, las víctimas son instruidas para impedir su libre circulación con discursos tales como que serán deportadas o detenidas. De este modo garantiza su permanencia en los lugares de la explotación y su dependencia de los tratantes, quienes paradójicamente con este tipo de amenazas se presentan como los garantes de su seguridad. Ante la falta de información sobre sus derechos, las víctimas son degradadas en su autonomía y en su seguridad psicofísica. El Ministerio de Justicia de la Nación de Argentina presta un servicio que es esencial a las víctimas, que es una línea de teléfono, la 145, en la que se pueden hacer denuncias gratuitas, anónimas, todos los días del año, las 24 horas. Cuenta con un protocolo de derivación según nos encontremos en una cuestión de flagrancia o según nos encontremos en una situación sobre, de, en la que se debe trabajar sobre una investigación preliminar. El Programa Nacional de Rescate interviene en todos los allanamientos, es decir, no se produce un allanamiento de fuerza policial sobre un presunto delito de trata sin este equipo interdisciplinario. Y de esta manera lo que le garantizamos a la víctima desde ese primer momento es su derecho a la, firma, a la información. Y así iniciamos el proceso de reconstrucción de su autonomía. También se les informa sobre su posibilidad de regularizar su situación migratoria y que no pueden ser en ningún momento acusadas de un delito que hayan cometido durante el periodo que hayan sido tratadas. Saben ustedes que los tratantes muchas veces las obligan a cometer delitos, pase de drogas, eh, abortos, y son esos los mecanismos que utilizan luego para mantenerlas calladas y bajo eh, su poder. Como les decía, la, la asistencia entonces no discrimina por nacionalidad y las víctimas reciben un acompañamiento, acompañamiento con asistencia psicológica, social, jurídica y médica desde el primer momento en que se inicia el allanamiento. En cuanto al marco normativo argentino, tenemos, elevamos el estándar, el estándar en cuanto a dos cuestiones, el protocolo de Palermo. Una, tenemos contemplado tanto la trata interna como la trata externa y, eh, por otro lado, también eh, hemos eliminado la posibilidad del consentimiento de la víctima mayor, que era una de las cuestiones más utilizadas porque posteriormente los tratantes amenazan a las víctimas luego de los allanamientos para poder avanzar en las causas vinculadas a la trata de personas. 
Estamos actualmente con un desafío enorme, que es el que tengo eh, en cabeza hoy como responsabilidad, que es la conformación del Consejo Federal, generar políticas públicas con todos los estados provinciales, Argentina tiene 24 jurisdicciones, es un país muy extenso, eh, tenemos 24 códigos de procedimientos eh, diferentes, tenemos víctimas muy distintas aún dentro del mismo eh, territorio. Y estamos con el desafío de generar el procedimiento de decomiso y la administración de este decomiso que, con este Consejo Federal, el que también quisiera resaltar está compuesto por la sociedad civil. Eh, son muchas las cuestiones en las que debemos avanzar para generar una institucionalidad que sea transparente, que genere políticas con enfoque diferencial en la reparación eh, de las víctimas. Creo que esto es uno de los desafíos, se ha mencionado en varios de los paneles más importantes. Cómo lograr medidas contextualizadas según cada una de las situaciones que vamos a enfrentar. Finalmente, quisiera decir que tenemos adelante un enorme problema en el mundo actual, pues se ha empezado a instalar ahora el peligroso discurso del miedo. Y en orden a la supuesta promoción de un mundo más seguro, se ha empezado a constituir un concepto muy peligroso, donde el no nacional ingresa prácticamente en la categoría del enemigo. En consecuencia, migramos de un mundo de sociedades abiertas a un mundo de sociedades cerradas, donde las migraciones irregulares sin duda alguna se acrecentarán y los factores de vulnerabilidad a los que están expuestas estas poblaciones migrantes también se verán exponencialmente agravados. Todos estos factores nos obligan a estar mucho más atentos como Estados. Debemos establecer marcos migratorios claros y sencillos, establecer requisitos que sean fáciles para poder ordenar el estatus migratorio de la persona que ingresa al país, promover mecanismos de regulación efectivos y establecer dispositivos territoriales que promuevan con enfoque diferencial el empoderamiento legal de estas poblaciones. Solo así podremos caminar hacia sociedades más justas, más pacíficas y sobre todo más inclusivas, donde el mundo sea un lugar de futuro mejor para todos y donde podamos hacer honor a las promesas que asumimos con los objetivos del desarrollo de no dejar a nadie atrás. Muchas gracias. Much, muchas gracias. We turn now to Mr. Ola Enriksson, who is the Director General of the Department of Migration and Asylum in the Swedish Ministry of Justice. He's worked in the field of migration and asylum for more than 25 years both at the national and international level. He's currently the head of the Swedish delegation of the Strategic Committee on Immigration, Frontiers, and Asylum. Please, you have it. Thank you very much, and thanks to IOM for inviting me to taking, uh, speaking here, and good afternoon, everybody. The number of men, women, and children suffering violence, abuse, exploitation, and rights violations should make us all deeply concerned. Among migrants, there is a range of legally different categories comprising people whose status may change over time. The commitment to develop two global compacts is a unique opportunity to improve the way we cooperate on migration and refugees. The synergies and operational challenges on the ground should be reflected in both compacts. When addressing the situation of vulnerability and risks faced by migrants, the shortcomings of the international systems are for, first and foremost a matter of lack of implementation and coordination. Our cooperation mechanism should better equip and, uh, us to implement agreed principles, commitments and recommendations. Migrants in vulnerable situation is a cross-cutting issue which, which relates to both compacts. To avoid groups falling in between these two compacts, we should welcome a joint discussion paper by the SRSG for migration with input from IOM and UNHCR on this issue. We would like to highlight five ways to reduce the risk of vulnerability faced by migrants in transit and destination. First, combating trafficking in human beings and smuggling of migrants. 
The links between these two types of crimes must not be underestimated. Enhancing the cooperation and coordination between relevant stakeholders will contribute to a comprehensive and effective assistance to victims of trafficking and other forms of abuse. This can be done at all levels, from international to local. Common training tools for the police, social workers, migration officers and other professionals may contribute to a holistic view. Second, improving the increasing and increasing the management of migration along migration corridors. This can be done by increasing the number of migrant assistance centers. These centers can serve several purposes concurrently, including assessing and collecting data on the vulnerabilities faced by migrants during the journeys. They can also provide support for those in need, as well as counseling and information about the risks associated with irregular migration. Third, combating the abuse of labor migrants. Labor migration must be regularized, fair and orderly in order to ensure proper protection of labor and human rights for all working people. For instance, instruments aimed at fair recruitment, such as the IOM IRIS initiative, as well as IOL's guiding, ILO's guiding principles on fair recruitment, should be in place. An important factor is to include all relevant stakeholders in the process and dialogue government agencies, trade unions, and employers. Fourth, improving our response to meet specific needs of vulnerable groups. This includes implementation of protection measures concerning children. For instance, we must end the practice of detaining migrant children solely for the purpose of determining their migration status. We must also address the vulnerabilities of displaced and migrating women and girls. In this regard, actors along the migratory routes should integrate a gender perspective in their work, as well as promote sexual and reproductive health and rights and to combat gender-based violence. Fifth, achieving a dignified and effective system of voluntary return. This includes strengthening the consular capacities of countries of origin, awareness raising and increased cooperation between states. Such support can prevent and protect migrants from human rights abuses, exploitation and the dangers that onward movements otherwise expose them to. The main challenge ahead is to address the vulnerabilities faced by migrants on the move through concrete actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. We, we turn now to Nigeria with Dr. Alakija, who is the Chief Humanitarian Coordinator of the Emergency Coordination Center in Nigeria and a high-level interlocutor between state and non-state actors at the governmental and intergovernmental levels. An activist for social justice, Dr. Akalija is also a globally renowned authority on sustainable human development and has previously worked with the UN Population Fund and UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund. Please, you have the word. Thank you very much for having me. I was saying that it's the late graveyard shift, so I thought people are getting a little tired, so I would stand up and liven things up a little. I'm also going to shift the conversation slightly, as we've listened all day today to the talk of migration, and we've spoken about migrants. And all day we have referred to migrants as though they're a different species, a different people, as though they are not one of us. And as I listened to all of that and listened to the talks of integration and inclusion, I suddenly thought to myself, who isn't a migrant? I think that probably should be one of the key questions of this global compact on migration. Who is not a migrant? I'm going to speak first to fundamental issues and then I'm going to go to the country-specific context on this global con compact. I, like many others who've spoken today, I'm a migrant, a returnee, married to the son of a man who migrated to Nigeria over a hundred years, great-grandson, great sorry, he's not quite that old, over a hundred years ago from Brazil, a man who was knighted by King George V and who became the writer of the Nigerian constitution. I have a daughter because of my job that moved me to the Pacific, to the Fiji Islands, who can be classified as a migrant, a Fijian, 
who at the age of 16 represented Fiji as the youngest athlete at the London Olympics. She has contributed to that nation, as I have into the one that I married into for love and my husband for the one his grandfather came into in search of roots and in search, search of better, better opportunities. So who is not a migrant? If I were to ask for a show of hands, there would be very few in this room who are not personally from a migrant background or linked to migrants in some way. Australia, my closest neighbour when I'm in the Pacific, of course, was founded based on migration from Europe. America has been built on the back of migration. England, which is where my voice comes from, as many people often ask me, and I'm sad that my Sierra Leonean sister is not here to hear that I also have an accent <laughs> that often doesn't fit in settings that I'm at. So all of us, really, in some way or another, are migrants. Therefore, I think the question needs to be, who is not a migrant? And what is different today? Why are we so afraid? It is the increased competition for resources. It is mistrust, it is fear, it is exclusivity. The technical jargon of social inclusion is often lo loosely flung about, but it is loss of that social inclusion that gives rise to this fear. I say that because I come from Nigeria and I, I, I now am the Chief Humanitarian Coordinator for the Government of Nigeria. And Nigeria has seen an unprecedented outflow of migrants both within and outside Africa. With a projected population of about 400 million by 2030, this is a critical conversation for us as a nation and also for you as a global community. Nigeria is also a host country to migrants from across Africa. As well as Europe, I have several friends who are from Europe. It is a country of origin. Also, we have a unique and complex situation. We need to look in Nigeria, and we're beginning to do this at a policy level, look at what are the drivers of migration. What are the root causes? We have two dynamic things going on right now in Nigeria. In the south of the country, it's, it's economic. There are many young people who are fleeing across the Mediterranean. In fact, unfortunately, the majority of, of, of those who went into Italy this year, um, I think the number is about 14,118, according to the latest statistics from IOM and the Population Commission in Nigeria, were Nigerian. What is driving that? It is hopelessness. It is the thought that there are no jobs for them at home. It is the thought that they're worried about the future for their children. Then we have the northeast of the country where we have a raging conflict that is now under control by Boko Haram. We have over 300,000 refugees across the borders in Chad, Niger, and Cameroon. We have some who've migrated also, also across to Europe. So we are dealing as Nigeria, as a huge country with a complex, complex issue. Preventing migration for us in this context will, will mean preventing, number one, the economic downturn, and also preventing the violent rhetoric that has destabilized part of our country. Preventing violent rhetoric implies that root causes of the violence be addressed. Education, health, jobs, and security. Essentially, we're talking about social justice. And that is what the government of Nigeria seeks to do right now by implementing safe social safety nets, by implementing durable solutions together with our partners, by dealing and working very closely with those who are affected, by working with the IDPs within Nigeria themselves, of whom we have 1.8 million. I heard somebody talk earlier today about the fact that the Italian gentleman, the mayor, he talked about the fact that Europe has welcomed over a million refugees last year, while the city of Maiduguri alone in Nigeria took in over 1.8 million refugees into one city, one city in one part of the country. They were welcomed in. It, it wasn't without conflict, but they were looked after as brothers, as sisters, and many, over 1.1 million of them, remain there today. Oftentimes, reports of migrants being forced to return to their places of origin or refugees are flagged. And to stop this, migrants need to be informed that unless where they're going to is safe and the return is voluntary, that they're not obligated to move back. It is up to us as nations and as international community to ensure that this is so. Achieving this to reduce further vulnerability will, amongst other things, require a multi-dimensional and multi-sectoral approach. 
At continental level, Nigeria is also working very closely with our brothers and sisters in the Africa Union. This month, we chair the Peace and Security Council and will be undertaking a high-level trip, a visit across the effect most affected countries of the region by the Boko Haram crisis and by the refugee and migrant situation. I'm very pleased to hear that IOM is looking at risk and protective factors as you look into this global compact for migration. Director General Swing earlier spoke about the fact that we're at a historical moment. I say that we are indeed at a historical moment. I think, in fact, what you said exactly is that we have a rendezvous with history. We're at a critical point at which we must all remember that many, many, many years ago, the Bantus came, the, 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 the Arabs came, everybody came from all over and formed communities where they lived and they worked together. If we do not remember that fundamental fact today, we will be facing a world in great crisis. We will be facing a world where we cannot have these conversations because we will all be at odds with each other. I remind us all as I close today that look next to you. Look at your brother, look at your sister. Remember that we are one people. Remember that we are one family. Remember that protectionism isn't going to get us anywhere, but that by working together, hand in hand, by building this global compact, by producing and by implementing policies that will save and protect people's lives and dignity is how we're going to move this world forward. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Very quickly, um, I wanted to go through these frameworks to understand the discussion that we had this morning about understanding vulnerability in the migration context and introduce you to a set of principles and, and guidelines that are in draft form on the human rights protection of migrants in vulnerable situations. The mandate of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights clearly refers to the promotion and protection of the human rights of all people. Um, this includes, of course, all migrants, regardless of their status, that we recognize as human rights holders. And this recognition has been made clear also in the New York Declaration in paragraph 5. Indeed, we see the New York Declaration as a human rights-based um, document. There are over 100 references to human rights in it, and we believe that the, the promise of this declaration should be fulfilled in the global compact going forward. It is our view that robust human rights protection that are accessible to all will, have, will lead to improved human rights outcomes for all people in society, migrants as well as the communities that they leave, as well as those that they arrive into. Uh, there are obviously a multiplicity of legal categories into which people on the move may be located, and indeed we've heard about um, uh, many of those categories in the course of today and indeed on this panel, sometimes simultaneously. In practice, though, we observe that many people on the move today face numerous barriers to claiming their human rights. And this categorization, thus, is ultimately only useful insofar as it improves the protection response. The international legal protection framework um, that we have in order to construct um, a defense of the vulnerability starts with international human rights law. All migrants, as I said, have all human rights. In addition to the, frame, the base framework of protection, we then have the various um, specific frameworks of protection into which the specific categories um, of people on the move um, are, are entitled. However, I would like to say that a focus on vulnerability does not and should not lead to the conclusion that there are some migrants who are non-vulnerable um, and therefore, being non-vulnerable, do not have human rights. There is a danger as well of establishing hierarchies of vulnerability, of saying that some people are more vulnerable than the others um, and that therefore the people at the bottom have no rights. We need to ensure that the baseline protection for all people remains without discrimination. Understanding vulnerability in the migration context um, led us to focus on the situation of the individual migrant. This is the basis of the human rights framework. And we've been looking then to see the gaps in human rights protection um, that various people on the move um, can experience as they move, understanding then that there are need for specific protection interventions. In the New York Declaration um, and in the modalities resolution that establishes the process of the Global Compact, member states have recognized and committed to address the special needs of all people in vulnerable situations in accordance with their obligations under international law. 
Clearly, this should not be understood as an absence of agency on the part of migrants. And this was a point that was made very clearly as well in the opening sessions of this meeting. Um, the human rights framework, while focusing on the violations that, that people may experience, understand people as rights holders. This does not mean um, that victims of violations are not also agents. So migrants in vulnerable situations, in, in our understanding, um, are individuals who are not able to fully exercise their human rights. The basis of these vulnerabilities um, can be understood as a range of factors, whether due to the identity or circumstance of the person, such as their age, their gender, their sexual orientation and gender identity, their health, their migratory or disability status, the situation that they face in their country of origin, which do not lead to refugee movements, but need nonetheless to um, movements that are vulnerable, such as movements related to climate, disaster and environmental factors, endemic poverty, food insecurity, discrimination in access to health, education, housing or decent work. There are also vulnerability related to the situation that migrants face en route, in transit, at borders, and at reception, and at destination, particularly in the context of lengthy, fluid, and fragmented, multi, often multi-directional journeys. Vulnerability in this context can arise as a result of a range of factors that are often intersecting, that can coexist simultaneously, and can indeed influence and exacerbate each other. Situations of vulnerability may change over time as circumstances change or evolve. And one of the things that we have learned, that people who are compelled to move due to the circumstances um, that I noted earlier, in irregular and precarious movements, are often particularly at risk of harm. So the case for attention to the human rights of migrants in vulnerable situations was established. We know that an international legal framework exists that protects the rights of all migrants. And also that migrants in vulnerable situations are entitled to a heightened duty of care by the state. However, understanding of the human rights standards for such migrants, as well as of how states and of course other stakeholders can operationalize these standards in practice is often lacking. Therefore, we believe that there is a need for practical guidance on addressing protection gaps experienced by migrants who will not benefit from refugee protection but who nonetheless are not moving voluntarily and or in a protected manner. And this has been the basis for some of the work um, that we have uh, started today in conjunction with the Global Migration Group. The principles and guidelines on the human rights protection of migrants in vulnerable situations is an effort of the Global Migration Group's working group on human rights and gender equality, which is co-chaired by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and UN Women and includes, among other um, members, IOM, UNHCR, ILO, UNICEF, and others. The work that we've put together has been carried out through an open consultative and multi-stakeholder process, and indeed the General Assembly recognized this endeavor in paragraph 51 of the New York Declaration. The Human Rights Council has asked the High Commissioner to present a progress report to the Human Rights Council session in March. And indeed, a number of member states of the Human Rights Council, in addition to over 100 civil society organizations and academics from all regions, have constructively engaged with the draft principles and guidelines, assisting us in refining them on the basis of their expertise and their experience. The principles and guidelines are without prejudice uh, to the specific rights of groups with precise entitlements under international law, be they refugees, traffic persons, migrant workers, or others. And they are anchored in and indeed the principles are derived directly from international human rights law and standards and related bodies of law. The principles and guidelines themselves are supported by practical guidance, which is examples of promising practice from all regions. They are designed to assist states and other stakeholders to develop, to strengthen, to implement and monitor measures to protect migrants in vulnerable situations. There are 20 principles and the issues covered, as you will see, um, range over most of the, the issues that we have heard about in the course already of uh, today's discussion. In the next few slides, I just wanted to give you a, a brief snapshot of the draft principles and guidelines um, to, to understand what they describe. For instance, principle six um, asks states to ensure that all returns fully respect the human rights of migrants and comply with international law. Issues that we um, have looked at within these um, guidelines um, 
talk about the prohibition and arbitrary or collective expulsions, speak to what consent will mean uh, in a voluntary return process and how to ensure that consent is indeed uh, meaningfully given. It also talks about the specific um, uh, protections that children should be given in a return process um, and ask that the best interest of the child should be the primary uh, guiding principle for return of children. Principle 7 talks about violence and exploitation and there speaks, for instance, um, about the establishment of accessible and confidential services for migrants who are victims of such violence um, and asks states to put in place measures to ensure that migrants can report crimes um, and insists that all migration facilities should adhere to standards for preventing and responding to violence, including sexual and gender-based violence. We also looked at um, the whole issue of health, and this is an, an, an issue that has been raised already in, in this discussion. Looking, for instance, at timely and accurate information on health and health rights, which should be made available um, across migratory routes. Providing access to comprehensive and rights-based sexual and reproductive health information and services. And looking at the very important issue of mental health needs, which are often go uh, unrecognized. The principles also um, throughout uh, look at the important point about binding and effective firewalls, which means that migrants, particularly migrants in irregular situations, will then not fear um, accessing, in this case, uh, uh, public health providers um, in, in case of need. So just to end, um, in going forward, uh, the Human Rights Council has requested the High Commissioner for Human Rights to submit the principles and guidelines at its 37th session, which is upcoming in March uh, 2018. And indeed, we believe that further work remains to ensure that the principles and guidelines can be disseminated and effectively implemented. And there, of course, we count on um, not just the Global Migration Group, um, and its partners, uh, but of course all of you here in the room today. The remaining question is how we can use this tool um, to explore synergies between this tool and the global compact process, particularly given the latter's um, important focus on principles, commitments and understandings, and, and, and use this uh, to uh, provide the support that member states need um, in order to uh, ensure the protection of migrants in vulnerable situations. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pia, for, for giving us an overview of some of the work that's already been undertaken. We'll turn now to our final speaker, and um, Mr. Nalambar Badal, who is Program Director of the Asian Human Rights and Culture Development Forum, also known as the Migrant Center, the organization of and for migrant workers. He's been contributing to civil society movement as coordinator of the National Network for Safe Migration, an umbrella organization of the 19 migrants' rights organizations and for f respect, fulfillment, and upholding migrants' rights. He's also been representing Nepali's civil society in the regional and global migration consultative processes. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, and your excellencies. I would like to thank IOM for the opportunity. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here today to share with you the vulnerability of the migrants and the practices of the safe migration. I come from the region where the large population is directly or indirectly related to migration. Almost every second household are dependent on the remittances sent back home for their livelihood. And thousands of youth leave home for employment to go to the other countries. Migration has evolved as a tradition uh, in our region in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, it's either the home country or the host country. People are desperate to leave leave the country and explore the employment at the destination, exposing themselves to the vulnerabilities. Especially the women and children are at the risk, greater risk, at all stages of migration cycle. Spe uh, while the countries are focusing on the curative measures, trying to focus themselves on the management of migration flow, and are often not assessing the preventive measures adequately. Some of the practices uh, in the countries focusing on reducing the vulnerabilities of the migrants on the move are well designed, but the implementation is really very poor. 
Some of the home countries have made the pre-departure orientation mandatory in the process of migration. However, the syllabus of the orientation and the generalized information on the overall migration process has not been able to attain a good result. There should be a post-arrival orientation as an induction to the work and familiarizing the migrants to the local context as well. The training should be made mandatory and should be provided by the host country immediately upon arrival. The pre-departure and the post-arrival orientation should be complementing each other and the syllabus should be designed in joint collaboration among the home and the host countries. It is necessary to set up the information, communication and counseling centers at the community level, easily accessible uh, and accessible to the migrants, workers and their families. Such outreach centers should be institutionalized and need to be operated by the local government authorities in the support of the civil society organizations. The returning migrants and the families of the migrants can be the resources for such centers. Regular dialogue among people, including returnees and the local authorities, can suggest the practical solutions to the problems faced by the migrant workers and their families. Local authorities should have maximum involvement on in the community activities and engage community members in awareness issues. Engagement of the police and the local government in the access to justice mechanism for the migrants can increase the scope and coverage of the responses. The migrants and their families should have the e easy access to the law enforcement system. The engagement of the police administration in the issues of migration can re reduce the vulnerability of the migrants to fall into the trap of smuggling and trafficking records. To ensure the safe migration, the recruitment costs should also be borne by the employer in all trades, not just the uh, high-end trades. Recognizing all migrants, including the, mig uh, the domestic migrant workers under the labor law at home or host countries should be devised and institutionalized in order to reduce the vulnerability of the migrants at the different stages of migration cycle. Policy coherence is a necessary component to avoid contract substitution and other recruitment-related problems. The policy and the other relevant laws at the home and the host country should be coherent and adhere to the international legal mechanisms. A mechanism for the access to information and justice at the destination should be devised and institutionalized. The host country should design a simple and affordable, free as far as possible, access to justice mechanism while the home country should provide the translation and other facilitating services to the migrants at the destination countries. A simple and accessible redress mechanism has to be developed jointly by the host and home country together. The complaint mechanism should be simple and accessible to the migrant workers and should be available in the local languages of the migrant workers. The interpreter services should be made available to the migrant workers while the migrant workers should be able to file their complaints and concerns through even the telephone services. The migrant workers should be provided the individual and prompt responses to their complaints to avoid further vulnerability. All the services provided to the migrant workers should not just be made available to the migrant workers at home or host country, but it should be extended to the transit country as well. We have to consider the fact that the migration in terms of process and context are different in the different regions. The blanket policies and the structures may not be workable in all the context. Therefore, the region-specific redress and protection mechanisms should be established, but it should adhere to the global standards. Dignity and respect of human beings should never be overlooked for the protection of the borders. There are no opposition to the notion migrant workers are no commodities, but migrants are still facing the worst treatments. The attitude of the people have to change in order to realize a place where all the human rights standards are respected, protected, and fulfilled. As long as people do not understand and recognize that the migrant workers are contributing to the development of both the home and the host countries, the things are not going to change easily. Finally, governments around the world are concentrating themselves on the migration management and the border protection. The human protection and the social economic well-being of migrants are often the secondary priority. In this context, the forum like this is very crucial. I would like to call the governments, civil societies, and the private sectors, media, migrants, and communities around the world to come together for the respect, protection, and fulfillment of the rights of migrants, regardless of their classifications and status. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I understand that a representative from Costa Rica would like to speak. Is Mr. Obando in the room? Gracias, Doña Elizabeth. Costa Rica se ha distinguido en la comunidad y organismos internacionales por su tradición de asilo 
y de hospitalidad, producto de nuestra trayectoria democrática, económica y social. Aunque Costa Rica ha recibido a través de su historia personas extranjeras de diversas nacionalidades, siempre es difícil prever cuál será el comportamiento de los desplazamientos migratorios no planificados y la afectación para el país receptor y la sociedad en general. Los patrones migratorios cambian constantemente y representan un reto para los países de destino y de tránsito, de, de tal forma que se puedan dirigir acciones que posibiliten una administración ordenada y segura de la migración. Si bien Costa Rica, reconociendo esos retos y el comportamiento de estos desplazamientos, promulgó una política migratoria integral, iniciada en el 2013 hasta el 2023, orientada para atender principalmente dos poblaciones de migrantes en ese momento, todo con el fin de articular acciones conjuntas para gestionar y controlar los flujos migratorios y procurar la integración de las personas migrantes a la sociedad costarricense y promover un desarrollo a través de la administración efectiva de la migración. Sin embargo, a final del año 2015, Costa Rica experimenta un cambio notorio en los flujos migratorios en todos sus niveles. Es así que dicha, migra eh, dicha política migratoria tuvo que actualizarse este año ante los importantes flujos migratorios de los ciudadanos hermanos cubanos a finales de dicho año, que en total sumaron 7.800 en un mes, y los flujos extrarregionales, llamados así en nuestro país, para el periodo de marzo de 2016 y junio de 2017, contabilizaron un total de 22.000 personas, movimientos humanos que nuestro país no estaba acostumbrado, cambiando Costa Rica de ser un país destino a un país de tránsito, lo que hace también vulnerable a diferentes redes criminales locales y transnacionales, de entre las que podemos citar las redes de trata de personas y tráfico ilícito de migrantes. Estos nuevos flujos representan un reto mayor para el Estado costarricense, ya que se movilizan sin documentos de identificación o de viaje, lo que dificulta notablemente la aplicación del control migratorio, ya que no se conoce con certeza su identidad, vital para poder aplicar las medidas a nivel integral. Es así que nuestro país implementa la identificación de todo migrante extrarregional por medio de un documento migratorio, que es conocido permiso de ingreso y tránsito, que les permite el ingreso y permanencia por un plazo determinado en el territorio costarricense. Lleva consigo una fotografía y toda la información referente al portador y se establece la observación que con ese documento puede transitar en el territorio nacional y ser atendidos en los centros de salud. Como medida para una gestión migratoria a corto plazo y con áreas de ejercer acciones inmediatas y extraordinarias a fin de resguardar la seguridad nacional y garantizar los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes en tránsito y en condición irregular, en octubre del 2016, el gobierno de Costa Rica emite una directriz presidencial que establece los lineamientos para la coordinación y colaboración interinstitucional para la atención integral de las personas en tránsito, pertenecientes a los flujos migratorios mixtos que atraviesan el territorio nacional hacia el norte del continente. Además, los presidentes de Costa Rica y Panamá llegan a un acuerdo bilateral que asegura un flujo controlado entre ambos países al limitar una cantidad máxima de personas por día para que el tratamiento de estos flujos se diera de manera adecuada y de acuerdo con las necesidades y posibilidades operativas de nuestro país. Ante esta situación extraordinaria, el gobierno de Costa Rica adoptó varias medidas para asistir a las personas migrantes en tránsito irregular. Es así que se crean dos centros de atención temporal para migrantes en colaboración con la OIM y el ACNUR y lógicamente varias instituciones eh, del Estado costarricense que lo que hace es proveer de alimentación, agua y alojamiento y atención integral a todos los migrantes que se encuentren en tránsito por Costa Rica. En síntesis y para finalizar, Costa Rica se seguirá caracterizando por atender de manera segura, digna, controlada y humanitaria las migraciones en el uso de las normativas nacionales, como lo dije, una directriz presidencial, una actualización de la política migratoria, un documento de permiso de ingreso de tránsito, así como las operacionales, como lo son la habilitación de los centros de atención y la asignación de fondos económicos para el funcionamiento y la coordinación de las instituciones del Estado. Por eso, seguiremos luchando. Seguiremos liderando las luchas para que estas rutas de movilizaciones humanas, no solo a nivel local, sino también a nivel regional, estén siempre bajo el respeto de los derechos humanos, bajo una responsabilidad compartida, permitiéndoles a los migrantes una asistencia básica. Que Dios les bendiga. En Etiopía, thousands of migrant workers, who are mainly women and low skilled workers, live for the Gulf countries for search of employment. From 2011 to 2013 alone, 430,000 Ethiopians left for Gulf countries through a private employment agencies. 
quite significant others left the country through traffickers and smugglers. In a bid to curb the flow of irregular migrants and address the gaps in protection of rights of migrant workers, Ethiopia took numerous measures. The 2016 Overseas Employment Proclamation, for instance, puts that all costs of employment to be borne by employers so that recruitment be ethical and fair. Employers are also required to provide mandatory health insurance for migrant workers. Skills training and pre-departure orientations are also made mandatory procedures. Ethiopian private employment agencies are required to provide 100,000 USD in a blocked account to be used as compensation in case migrant workers face infringements of rights. A range of penalties, including cancellation of license, is also included in the new Overseas Employment Proclamation. Ethiopia has also banned direct employment of migrant workers to ensure their rights are guaranteed in the host countries. Ethiopia has also signed bilateral agreements <coughs> and memorandum of understandings with the Gulf countries to ensure basic labor standards of migrant workers are secured. The for example, in the, the provision of minimum wage. <coughs> we believe that bilateral agreements provide important instruments to address vulnerability. At national level, we have also ratified the Palermo Protocol and passed a national legislation that severely punishes traffickers and smugglers. Ethiopia is fighting irregular migration by inter alia, addressing the root causes. In 2016 alone, Ethiopia created 2.6 million jobs through micro-crediting programs. We have recently launched a half billion dollar revolving fund for youth employment programs. In some, Ethiopia believes that addressing migrants in vulnerable situations requires close cooperation between host and home countries, standardizing bilateral agreements to have adequate reference to human rights. It also needs ensuring regional consultative process are inclusive. It is important that regional economic communities are as well given key role in the governance of migration. Thank you, Madam. Yes, please, Kenya. Thank you, Madam. First of all, I want to thank IOM for having invited me for the second time to this forum and also uh, for having assisted Kenya uh, to come up with a very robust national coordination mechanism on migration. Uh, this mechanism has played a very significant role in addressing migrant plights in Kenya. For example, it has come to reconcile the theoretical perspectives of many agencies uh, that are involved in migration governance in Kenya, particularly those uh, dealing with the vulnerabilities. Uh, the national coordination uh, mechanism on migration operates on the premise of a whole of society approach to migration governance in Kenya bringing all relevant stakeholders, uh, including state actors, non-state actors, academic uh, researchers, uh, faith-based organizations, and even private individuals uh, in a continuous migration dialogue. And this has really uh, gone a long way uh, to address uh, migrant vulnerabilities, for example, we have many state actors that are actually uh, threatening, actually threatening the vulnerability of migrants, mostly uh, people who work in the borders, 
uh, people who work in the police, people who work in the intelligence, all these have a mercantilist and idealistic, uh, not idealistic, but a realist approach to migration governance. They are overemphasizing uh, national security at the expense of the liberal human right issues. So we have been able to bring together the police and the international organizations and civil society to reconcile their approach to migration governance. And so the Ministry of Labor has come up with very clear uh, labor migration policy, a draft national labor migration policy that is going to address exploitation of labor. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has come up with a diaspora policy, which is actually existing, passed in 2015. And they have been able to rescue Kenyan workers in the Middle East who have faced a lot of uh, human rights violation. Their passports taken, some are injured by the employers. And they have actually de done this very successfully. They also raise awareness among communities about the dangers of irregular migration so that people who want to go and work outside it must be properly uh, briefed so that they know what to expect when they, uh, they go uh, abroad. We have always held uh, national consultative forums where we address issues to do with migrants. And these national consultative forums have always come to inform uh, the policy on migration. We are coming up with uh, a comprehensive uh, national migration policy which we hope to conclude before the end of this year. And in that draft policy, we have addressed all the issues uh, relating to vulnerabilities of all categories of migrants, whether they are asylum seekers, whether they are irregular migrants, whether they are refugees. We have a very uh, comprehensive refugee law, which was passed in 2006. We have uh, Counter-Trafficking uh, in Persons Act of 2010. Uh, we have Regulation of Employment Act, which was passed uh, uh, sometimes uh, a few years ago. And now uh, that act is regulating uh, around uh, recruitment agencies who used to deceive a lot of migrants in Kenya and taking a lot of their money. And therefore, we also had the 2014 uh, Security Laws Amendment Act, uh, which actually made border management a multi-agency outfit. And in that multi-agency outfit, all stakeholders that man the border are regularly taken through uh, training. And I want to thank IOM for having uh, partnered with, with us on this. Uh, probably I will get time during the uh, next session to talk much about uh, migrant vulnerability because of time. I would wish to uh, stop there. Thank you very much. I have Senegal and Serbia. Would you still like to speak? Voilà. Merci, Thank madame, par rapport à la thématique du jour. Donc, je pense que c'est un sujet très, très, très vaste donc, qui peut être abordé sous plusieurs angles. Donc, je dirais que ne serait-ce que sur le plan psychologique, une personne qui quitte son territoire et qui se retrouve dans un autre pays, donc, qui est loin de ses proches, donc sur le plan psychologique, déjà, il y a une euh, vulnérabilité là. Sur le plan sociologique aussi, donc, une personne qui quitte son territoire et se rend dans un autre 
pays, voilà, donc il a quitté sa société et il a besoin donc d'être intégré dans son euh, nouveau milieu de vie. Euh, après ce petit commentaire-là, donc j'ai juste une question euh, qui s'adresse à Madame Piero Oberia euh, du Haut Commissariat pour les droits de l'homme. Donc euh, et on a senti que ces derniers, ces, ces derniers mois, donc, le Haut Commissariat adresse d'importantes initiatives à l'initiative des migrants, notamment votre exposé sur les 20 principes et lignes directrices du Haut Commissariat sur les droits de l'homme. Donc on a aussi constaté lors du dernier Conseil des droits de l'homme, il y a eu une résolution qui a été adoptée pour mieux promouvoir et sauvegarder le respect des migrants. Voilà, donc là, ce sont des initiatives certes salutaires voilà, de les adopter, mais je voudrais savoir, après son après l'adoption euh, de ces lignes directrices et euh, résolutions, qu'est-ce qui est prévu pour leur mise en œuvre effective Est-ce qu'il y aura un mécanisme de suivi Est-ce qu'il y aura euh, des initiatives mises en place pour amener les États membres à mieux respecter ces initiatives-là Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Uh, from the perspective of the host country, 10% of our population are migrants, and uh, country of origin with diaspora over 2 million, our citizens abroad. And in few last year transit country, we from the 2040 facing uh, transit uh, of huge number of migrants uh, with uh, 12,000 persons entering into Serbia in one day on uh, the peak of the crisis. So from the, our perspective, uh, Serbia as a member of uh, uh, main international human, right, human rights instrument already had good legal foundation for implementing all policies and to protect migrants re regardless of uh, their status, but the things that are needed are how to uh, strengthen implementation of those policies and those laws. Our distinguished panelist just uh, a few minutes ago mentioned that we are threatened from uh, migration. So we think that the first thing that we need to do is to uh, deal with the safety, meaning the sense of safety of the local population. We need to uh, provide them with the feeling that they, they are safety, that uh, the country is implementing policy in the way that is prescribed by the laws, and in the same time uh, conduct measures combating xenophobia and, ras and racism. Uh, also very important for the implementation of our policies, which are very often prepared on some very high level, even on global level, is to strengthen local governments and local municipalities and communities, which are main implementer of all policies that we are uh, develop uh, some, somewhere in our capitals. So we think that the uh, target set by a 2030 agenda is good not only in the way that migrants contribute to the developing of the host community, that it is also good to develop community, then this host community will be a good protective environment for the newcomers. Uh, then we faced few times in the last two decades large movements, movements of people towards Serbia. So these movements impose big political and economic burden to the transit and host countries. Consequences could go to the extent that the local population suffer from decrease in life standard and the ex exercising of their rights is jeopardized. Therefore, prevention of such negative effects require burden sharing among all of us. This, in this should include responsibility sharing also, and this from the country of origin, responsible for the well-being of in its own citizens, and as well as the country of destinations, which often neglect pull factors that lead to irregular and unsafe migra migration. And on the end, I think that many 
uh, panelists and uh, today uh, highlighted this that uh, all migrants in irregular status are vulnerable regardless of their sex, age, health, marital or educational status. They are exposed to different forms of exploitation, abuse, even torture. The states have responsibility to immediately regularize their status, either through approval of their uh, residence or through return to the country of origin. We consider that this should be one of the co cornerstone of global compact, and it should be clearly binding to all stakeholders since we are facing recently that under the so-called protection of human rights, uh, uh, state is, let's say, uh, state has a series of obstacles in regularizing status of irregular migrants. Thanks. Please, Philippines. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, conscious of the time that we have, let me just quickly go to the question that I have. One is uh, on a question on uh, political buy-in uh, buy of states. We have, have heard uh, from the panelists several good examples uh, on, on what, how to address vulnerabilities of migrants. However, this remains to be national practices. Uh, what is needed may be given this is not just a national phenomenon, but a, an international phenomenon. And given the example of the draft uh, protection, uh, guidelines and protection on vulnerable mi and migrants in vulnerable situation. Let me ask the panelists on how do they propose that to, to get political buy-in for states so that this could be implemented on the ground. That's the second one. Uh, the second one is that um, the Philippines has always advocated that the protection of migrants is a shared responsibility of countries of origins, countries in transit, and countries of destination. I'm not sure if the panelist shares this, uh, the shares this, this, uh, this advocacy, and, uh, and, and, uh, but uh, I believe that uh, this, this, should be, this should be a principle that should be adopted uh, by, by states that uh, Countries of origins, countries of destination, and countries of transit should, have, should share the responsibility in protection of migrants. Uh, we would want to ask the panelists of their uh, uh, opinion on, on, on this uh, uh, advocacy. Thank you very much. Keep the floor. Agradecemos la, a la Organización Internacional de las Migraciones por la organización de este panel. Pues consideramos que el Pacto Global debe ser eh, debe tener en cuenta la vital cooperación internacional que garantice el diálogo y la colaboración genuina reconozca la responsabilidad compartida de todos los estados en materia migratoria y respete la soberanía e igualdad de todos los estados y otros fundamentos de la carta de las naciones unidas así como la integridad la dignidad y el bienestar de los migrantes hay acciones que algunos estados sin embargo no respetan y que son contrarias a este tipo de cooperación y es el caso de la denominada ley de ajuste cubano esta ley concede a los ciudadanos cubanos un trato migratorio preferencial y único en el mundo al admitir automáticamente en el territorio estadounidense a aquellos que llegan de manera irregular en violación de acuerdos migratorios bilaterales que buscan garantizar una emigración legal, segura y ordenada. Con esta política, a la par que se victimiza a los migrantes que caen en manos de las bandas de traficantes de personas con los riesgos que ello entraña para su seguridad, se crean dificultades a los países de tránsito en la América Latina y el Caribe. Esta política de ajuste cubano es, por tanto, un estímulo al contrabando de personas y la migración irregular directamente desde territorio cubano y también desde terceros países, incluyendo ciudadanos cubanos que viajan legalmente al exterior. El Pacto Global de Migraciones debe tener en cuenta que, las, que los migrantes sufren situaciones de vulnerabilidad específica, 
especialmente mujeres y niños migrantes, debido, entre otras cosas, a que no viven en sus países de origen y a las dificultades que afrontan a causa de diferencias de idiomas, costumbres y culturas, así como las dificultades económicas y sociales. Las realidades de este mundo globalizado imponen la necesidad inaplazable de la cooperación entre los Estados como base para la formulación e implementación de las políticas migratorias. Aunque estas forman parte del tradicional e irrenunciable ejercicio de la soberanía de los Estados, existe un creciente reconocimiento de que la migración es un fenómeno transnacional que necesita de la cooperación entre Estados a nivel bilateral, regional e internacional. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. We'll turn now to the panelists for their responses, and I direct your attention particularly to the question from the Philippines. You know, how do you get political buy-in? How do you implement even the existing frameworks that are quite good? Um, thank you very much um, for your appreciation for the, the, the work of the office um, in relation to migration. And um, we also commend the leadership of, of uh, Mexico and other member states within the Human Rights uh, Council uh, to bring this, this issue up uh, more uh, uh, integrally in in that forum. We agree, I agree completely that implementation is vital, that we, we can't just rest at the level of principles and we have to take this forward. One option in the global sense could in fact, in the, the, the global compact sense, could in fact be to um, explore how the means of implementation that is foreseen within the global compact process might include issues raised within the principles and guidelines, because that certainly would be a, a, a way of, of taking them forward. They are intended to support states, as, as I said, they're intended to support states, and in many cases the institutional, the, the legislative frameworks exist already. Certainly the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights stands ready, resources permitting, um, to provide the technical support um, and assistance that is needed. Um, to uh, states in order to put in place specific um, interventions um, in, in this regard. Uh, uh, turning maybe to just very quickly to, to the Philippines, um, the. The political buy-in, as, as we see it, one of the, the, the issues that we feel very strongly is that human rights protection of migrants, human rights protections of the communities into which they arrive, leads to better migration governance. And indeed, that is the imperative um, that should drive us forward into um, t putting these um, policies in place. So, so we believe really that it is not a zero-sum game between the communities of origin, the communities of destination of migrants, but really done right, um, uh, migration governance would benefit from such interventions. Thank you. I think we'll turn now to Ola Hendrickson. The responsibility for migrants lies with the country where the migrant actually is. If, if the migrant is in Sweden, then we have a particular responsibility to make sure that a certain set of, of human rights are protected. And it's also, of course, always a particular responsibility that lies on the country where the person is a citizen. But, but all countries have a, a responsibility to protect human rights of migrants, whether it's a country of origin, destination, or transit. Then on, on the buy-in, I think this is a principle. There are principles in... in uh, Pierre Oberoi mentioned the 20 principles that, that the OHCHR have put forward. There are also already in the, in the report from the Global Commission on International Migration that dates now 10 years back. There are some principles. There are also a very good chapter on human rights. I think that we have the basic principles. It's about implementation. The buy-in is to have, I think, a reasonable weighing of interests from, from states given, the, on the one hand, protecting human rights of migrants, but also upholding regulated migration and, and control of the flows of migrants. And so, so I think that is also in, on the buy-in um, from states. Thank you. Maria Fernanda. Um, we as Nigeria have taken very seriously our responsibility to ensure leadership and coordination and the proper implementation in upholding the rights and the dignities of migrants, be they internally displaced persons, be they refugees, or be they migrants outside of our shores. Um, we're doing this through a very strong 
national coordination mechanism, which is centered around a ministerial task force and from, led from the presidency. What we have seen is that if I were to li link very quickly um, hunger and mi migration, for instance, that 10 of the 13 current largest crises in the world are conflict-driven. For each year of conflict, an extra 10 people out of 10,000 will leave their country. For a 1% rise in hunger, an extra 200 people will leave their country. For us in Nigeria, this is a serious, serious matter, and these conversations cannot be held in isolation. For us, we're understanding that we must speak, and as um, somebody just said very, very, very eloquently, we must speak across, across borders bilaterally with our neighbors. We must speak regionally with the African Union, Commission and with ECOWAS, and we must speak internationally and cooperate at all levels to ensure that the, we, we uphold international human rights and to, to ensure that dignities are protected. Um, and then that is something that I think is very important taking forward for this global co compact is the inclusion of national authorities, national leadership, and national coordination. Thank you. Thank you. Are we serious enough to deal with the things we have here? We are raising the questions, concerns here. We are committing ourselves to everything, whatever comes up, and doing nothing. So I just want all of us, not just the governments, but all of us to be honest on what you are committing here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And certainly we've heard about the importance of implementing and translating into practice some of the good frameworks we had. We heard a number of very good concrete suggestions from national comprehensive policies in Kenya to establishment of migration corridors as a way of addressing it, as well as some of the bigger issues. As the representative from Serbia said, when people are in irregular situations, almost by definition they're vulnerable. And so taking action to create these safe pathways that we heard this morning are certainly related to reducing the vulnerabilities of migrants. But I want to thank the panelists and thank all of you for your attention at the end of a very long day. And thanks to ION for organizing a great beginning to this workshop. Thanks.